the, if in case people don't don't know, um, there's a there are massive marches marches march uh, events happening this weekend. So people may be doing that, which we will be providing a recording of this to those who have decided to go and protest. Um, yeah. So yes. Okay. Excellent. People are rolling in, so I just want to give a little bit of time before we get going here. Megan, so nice to have you. Thank you. It's for so good to be here. Saturday so morning. sorry that we had to reschedule everybody, but um, I'm happy to happy that we made it work. I'm excited to excited to, to chat with everyone. Same. Yeah. Really excited. Um, all right. Great. So um, real quick before we kick things off here, thank you for everybody who uh, upgraded um, their book bash registration. Um, we were able to do some really great work uh, in Ukraine with your support. Um, so thank you for that. We've got some updates coming out uh, about that as well. And right around the corner, um, just between just between us, GIST registration will be opening for 2022. So a lot coming. That's why I look the way I do. It's all the work that's happening. So um, despite Berto's best efforts to try to kill me on Twitter. So um, let's just get right into it. Um, I know there are a lot of questions. People are really excited about this panel. Um, it's very close to their heart for a number of reasons, but also we have a lot of burgeoning writers and screenwriters in this community. So uh, I just want to sort of talk a little about who Megan is, but I'm not going to go through the whole spiel because I feel like you will do a better job than I. You're such a, an illustrious writer. You have, you're the true definition of a writer to any medium. We've written across live television, animation, you've done podcasts, you've done comics, you've done so much. And, and coming from these is this humble origin story of Celebration Florida and the oldest of five children, you've become this incredible juggernaut of creativity. Um, so I'd love to just talk a little bit about uh, the, how, you, how you became you in this auspice a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you so much for that extremely kind introduction that uh, I, I hope to live up to. Um, yeah, so as, as Charlie said, I uh, grew up in Florida um, at a place called Celebration, which is uh, the town that Disney built. It's a very strange place to grow up. Um, my joke was always that I was the emo kid in the happiest place on earth, um, which a lot of people have recently been like, oh, so that didn't do anything for your story instincts um, uh, as a joke. But yes, I during that time, I think it was really helpful and influential because I, I was going through a lot of emotions and I was dealing with a lot of things and stories became my outlet. Stories became the, the thing that like was my saving grace. And so I did what any kid would do at the time, which was go to school to be a youth pastor. Um, and I'm really grateful for it. It, it is such a, a sort of deviation from where I'm at now. Um, but I, I would suggest it and support that um, because it gave me, it gave me some stuff that like, we'll, we'll talk about later. Um, but just that is more, more to bring to writing. Um, so I, I went through four years, I have a degree in church ministries and then decided like, oh, I really want to write. That is the whole point of what my, my hopes and, and what I wanted to do, why I wanted to be a youth pastor in the first place was to tell people that they are loved through stories. Um, and so I moved to LA and just, I knew nothing. I knew no one. I had absolutely no um, idea on how to write tv like I, I read every book that i could i took as many classes as i could i met as many people as i could um and part of the game in any aspect of entertainment is uh hard work and um deter like uh, uh what's pers perseverance like just being able to outlast i'm really i'm really blessed that i am able to like it's really expensive here so i was able to to do that i, I worked in various different jobs um that i am grateful to this day that had nothing to do with writing um but was able to help me persevere and, and stay in la and and keep keep pushing so um that is that is 
that is my story. That's how I got. Yeah, it. and you, you, so you rose to the ranks um, uh, in terms of the, be, becoming a staff writer on Supernatural, obviously, um, mm-hmm. and we'll talk about that a little bit as well, and and some of that process. But you've also written uh, for DC Superhero Girls. Um, you also have like the the fun notoriety of um, the latest run of Batman: <laughs> Urban Legends, in which Tim Drake, aka Robin, comes out as queer. Do you want to talk a little bit about that project? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've loved comics uh, since I was little. Um, it, it was a bonding element for me and my dad. It was also the only PG-13 movies that I was allowed to see because my parents were extremely uh, sheltering. And so, but my dad was like, no, these are superhero movies and these are comic books and we will be going to go see these movies. Doesn't, doesn't I don't count, care. doesn't count, yeah. That doesn't count, doesn't count. Um, we don't care about violence <laughs> was sort of... My, my family's view on uh, sheltering. Um, so I've always loved comics and it's, it had been a dream of mine to work in comics. I had uh, years before I had gotten uh, my DC gig, I had tried my hand at writing my own and I, I took classes for that. I, I self-published, well, I didn't self-publish, but I like found a writer or a, I, I was the writer, found the artist. That's, still early for me I'm so sorry uh found the artist through um a really great uh if anybody is interested in finding artists and not sure where to look there uh there's a hashtag on Twitter that Kelly Sue DeConnick who's an amazing comic book writer started called Visible Women and that was where I found my artist and worked for a year before even getting anything uh, from DC. And that really helped me practice it to the point now where, yeah, I I was able to write for for DC Comics and Robin. And that was such a very special run because there hadn't been much done with with Tim Drake, Robin. It's the third Robin for any of you who aren't, who don't really follow Robin or or Batman. Um, He's he's a great kid. He's really smart, Um, but was in this sort of stagnant place where nobody really knew what to do with him and they were like well do you want to write Tim Drake and I was like yeah absolutely I like I, I've loved Tim Drake I I've loved Tim Drake since he like first first came on the scene and um very much around the time of of my entrance and so there was a lot of like connective tissue pieces to that and uh but the more that I was uh digging into the character the more I was like oh there is this is a this is a man who is very or or really a teen because he's he's been 16 for years uh who is figuring out his sexuality figuring out his identity and I don't know if I can tell this story otherwise like I just don't know if there is uh any other story that can be told this is the truth of the character uh and I brought it very timidly I brought it and in an email because I was like I need to I I I need to have all of this written down. Um, but I brought it to my editor and was like, what do you think? Um, here is, I, I, I came with references. I took pictures of all sorts nice. of like over the course of years. Nice receipts. Um, absolutely. Mm. Um, but my editor was amazing and, and was so on board and was like, yeah, no, this makes sense to me. This you've, you've, I see the story that you're, you're telling where you're going. Uh, let's do it. Let's go. And everybody was super supportive everybody was on board and um we've been able to tell a story for for Tim that I'm really proud of and and has um I've I've received so many beautiful sweet messages from people um about it and I you know it to me is very much just an important aspect in hoping to help other people know that they are loved um because yeah he's he's a really cool character and I hope others see themselves in him and and help understand themselves more yeah and what a cool what a cool process and ability to do that to bring those kinds of stories out and you know we're so in need of those new more whole and full stories about people's identity and their expression and who they are and who they love I think you know it's it's uh, beautiful to watch unfold there's still a lot more work to be done obviously um yeah well can you can you tell us a little bit about what you know, the television screenwriting process entails? Is it a collaborative process or is it really, is it everyone in a writer's room working independently but along the same path? Like, what does that look like? Absolutely. So um, the short answer is that it is different for everyone. Um, And that the worst piece of advice that I ever got is the 
truest piece of advice, which was that every person's journey through television is different. And so there's no like normal path. Um, the unfortunate reality of that is that it is true. Like there are, there are people who um, only are the only writer for a show, especially because we are doing, there's been so many short um, order TV shows. So shows that have like six episodes. Um, sometimes that means that there is only one writer. Um, that has been the case for a lot of British TV for years. So it's not, that's not without precedent. Um, and American television for the last, I'm going to say 10 years, what we've done is more, um, barring, barring streaming, uh, it has been much more like there is a room, there's a room of people that come in, um, you, you blue sky it for the first couple of weeks of the room. So let's, let's say that you got your pickup, you, you heard that the series is going, um, at the end of May, because this is always happening, if for, if it's broadcast television, which is anything that's on NBC, ABC, CW, um, any of the, the quote unquote free channels, uh, we ch those shows get chosen around now, which is why you've seen a lot of cancellations recently, because upfronts are this month and upfronts are massive. Upfronts are when the uh, big wigs come in and they get a lot of people to give them a lot of money um, to advertise on television. So they need to prove to the advertisers that they've got some good stuff coming and um, there are shows. So what that means for television is that writer's rooms start late May, beginning of June. Um, once again, some of this is changing because of streaming services. Upfronts no longer matter necessarily. Um, but the first few weeks of that room opening, you have blue skying, you talk about the characters, you talk about what you see. This is different for shows that have been going on for 15 years, of course, but if it's a new show, then you, you're you sort of sitting down and trying to figure out who exactly these characters are. Um, and then once you sort of get that done and you have a sense of who they are, what the season's going to look like, you submit that to the studio network, you guys talk about it, you have notes, they, you, you fix all that together. Then you start in on the process of uh, breaking the episodes, which is um, an interesting process. I was going to say tedious. That's not fair. There are some people that really love it. There are some people that don't. I love it. I have a fun time with it. It is a long process and it is a process of um, the, the minutia, the beat by beats. Um, this is when you dig in. This is when you create an outline. Um, generally speaking, you do that with a large group of people. But like for a show like Supernatural, we sometimes did that on our own. We would go into um, what our offices and we would just sort of like come together and um, on my time at Supernatural, the staff was really close. And so we would go into each other's offices and, and sort of help. Um, so we would sort of create our own many writer's rooms um, as an offshoot of the major, like our big writer's room. Um, and uh, another difference that will also be part of that is that, is this a show that is a procedural versus a serialized show? So if it is a serialized show, most of those rooms break together all the time because every single story piece matters to every single person's episode so you do sort of have to be in there and even if you're off writing your episode so you're not coming in the room you still will read the room notes because something could have changed massively for your story um but if you're doing a procedural show there are pitch sessions that come through every couple of months where it's like okay well we've we've worked through these three four uh, episodes. Now we have to come up with the next one. So pitch what it could potentially be. Got it. Yeah. It's, and it sounds <clears throat> obviously really collaborative and depending on how the room is streamlined, like there's different sort of hierarchies or different structures maybe, but it sounds like there's compared to other writing processes and maybe we can talk a little bit about this, but the difference between screenwriting and other, and other forms of writing, whether it's a book or, you know, a blog or any of these other things, what would you say are the key differences between screenwriting and, and these other sort of media? Um, so as, as you have so kindly mentioned, I love writing in various different forms of media. And the reason is because there are different ways you have to be, you have to be intentional. There are different things that you focus on in different media forms. So for television, 
you are focusing on telling a visual story while also being aware that dialogue is key. So it's sort of a combination between a play and a movie. Um, with podcasts, uh, it is much more dialogue. It is much more like sound is key. So you have to pay more attention to like, what cool sounds can you do? Um, in comics, it's very much about um, visuals, but static images. So when you're writing comics, you can't write like, um, in this, uh, Tim Drake goes to open a door. That is a moving picture. We can't see that. But what we can see is Tim Drake is like starts to walk across the room. Tim Drake has hand on doorknob, like something yeah. along those yeah. lines. Um, and being mindful and aware of uh, good adaptations and what they get right. So for me, I think uh, Hunger Games is a really good adaptation because the book is so in Katniss Everdeen's head. Yeah that you can't, and you can't do that in a movie, but what they can do in a movie, which is really cool, is show the the cool effects, the visual effects of uh, the game master sort of playing yeah. the game. Yeah, That's, I mean, so there's a question here. Um, <clears throat> and yes, if you have questions, please use the Q&A uh, box. Yes, please. Um, and we will, we will try to get to as many as we can. Um, and we have a few other questions, obviously, but I think it's it's important that you all get a chance to ask your questions. This is a, a great opportunity, a huge opportunity to ask many questions. Um, so we have one question from Amy. You know, like every author, I dream of seeing my books adapted to the screen, and I'm thinking of pitching my my YA portal fantasy trilogy to Netflix once I finish book three. I'm struggling with coming up with a log line. Should I focus on it or just the book's plot or the overall plot of the trilogy? Any other tips on pitching and and, and besides the log line, is it outline the scripts? Like what, what can you impart uh, to someone who has this IP and wants to take it elsewhere? Um, so for this particular question, if you, when pitching what is generally required aside from log line, um, it, it, log line is what's gonna hook people. Um, I would, so for instance, in this particular situation, I would focus very much on your character and how the story starts. Um, I think that, especially in pitching, what people want to know, and this is still true, even though we don't do 100 episodes of television anymore for a TV show, um, people want to know how they can get 100 episodes out of a TV show. And so it's different than if you're pitching a movie or um, a short series. What you want to do is leave the question open-ended. So these are the characters. This is the crazy situation they're going to get into. How will it resolve? And you want to keep people on the edge of their seat while knowing that there is a hundred episodes worth of story to tell. And the nice thing is, you know, that there is because you believe in the story. And so as long as you believe it, the chance is there. It's just a matter of like finessing and getting a bunch of advice from like getting a bunch of advice from friends. We, and they don't even have to be writers. We are saturated with story and media. Every person that you know is. Um, our, our internal intelligence is really, um, our, our story intelligence is peak right now. Um, so share th that log line around with friends and see what they say and see what they, what they think. And if they, and, and ask them, do you think that there's a hundred episodes in this and sort of see if that, what piece they're not connecting with that you can uh, amp it up. Cause like I said, th that it is definitely there cause you believe in that story, so. Um, speaking of which, uh, do you mind if we share a little promo for an episode that you uh, have the yes, uh, writers absolutely. along with them? Um, so if, uh, for those of you familiar with Supernatural, which I'm assuming most of you are, um, this is, uh, here's a little promo from um, an episode that uh, Megan wrote. But, uh, I'm just going to wait for Berto to be spotlit. <clears throat> and then we will. Here we go. It's like we're stepping into a Saturday evening post. Sometimes at night after you're asleep, I look at them. They're very soothing. We're FBI. Wow, we a couple of G-men, huh? You hear about Conrad Martin. His head exploded like a ripe melon on the sun. Supernatural. Only next Thursday at 8, 7 central on The CW. All right, so let's talk about this episode. So that was your first full writing credit on season 14, episode mm -hmm. 15, Peace of Mind, right? Yep. 
And uh, so can you tell us a little bit about the process of how that episode came to be or how it was shepherded through the process a little bit so people get a, a sense for how that works? Absolutely. So for Supernatural, the process was uh, we would go in waves of pitching. It's technically a an episodic show, um, even though a lot of the, the myth was serialized. So every grouping of episodes around like uh, three to six episodes we would come in and we would pitch um and so for this and it was generally three episodes uh three different episodes each writer would pitch so i i had a one sheet that i had practiced that it was one sheet for each episode idea um but all of it started with the germ of an idea um a really cool concept like so for instance with um peace of mind it was um taking from my time growing up in celebration I knew that that was a weird experience I knew that that is something that only I could speak to um and so I wanted to pitch that and also pairing that with looking at what was going on in the season at the time and uh gauging the emotional interaction and what I wanted to see from from the characters and what I wanted to see how they were feeling um that is attended that is 10 uh, my tendency on where I draw stories, I tend to start from cool concept and deep emotional feeling. Um, there are writers that start from plot. There are writers that start from uh, character. It, it's just very dependent on what you as a writer. So there's no, basically what I'm saying is there's no wrong way to approach a story. But for me coming in and then sort of going through the, the very quick, simple beats of they come to this town, something's off. One of them starts to uh, adjust and get, uh, become more and more like the 50s mindset. There is a monster fight, emotional reckoning, move on to the next episode. Um, and making sure that Supernatural was really great because by the time I joined, uh, there, there was a very standard um, we know what each act is going to be. So I could sort of work within that. But if you are working on your own thing, um, yeah, coming at it from a, what is the cool concept and what is the emotion that I want that cool concept to kind of come in is is always my, my favorite way in on a story. Great, yeah, um, that was a really fun, I mean, I think a fun episode for everybody. It was uh, made a lot of, it got a lot of attention. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> Um, I'm very proud of it. Yeah, it's awesome. Um, is there, an, so you talked a little bit about sort of your transition from these other sort of disparate places and then bringing that. Um, and I think it's a good thing to also just sort of echo here is um, as we look at Gish or we look at any of our creative endeavors uh, to hear you, you know, it, rather than us saying, I don't have experience in writing or in this art form, I have experience over here that's very different you're talking about how you're channeling that into your work and then making it unique in your own. Can you talk a little bit about that process? I mean, how, how do you go from, I don't belong here, I belong back over here doing these other things to I belong in this room and I have this point of view. Like, did that take time? Was that something that uh, grew over as you did it more and more? It definitely was sort of an, an ostracizing thing in that there are so many people, especially in LA, who have gone to film school, have gone to the really nice film schools, all have opinions on Fight Club that I just, I hadn't seen until like, you know, 10 years ago. Um, and I think that definitely made me feel a little out of my own depths and elements. But the benefit of that, um, and this is something that uh, my old boss at Supernatural um, was always really keen on, on encouraging, was that... Uh, it's beneficial if everybody comes from the same place, uh, they're all gonna come with the same sort of story ideas and they're not going to be able to tell something differently. Um, he went to school to, uh, and studied history. So, you know, he, he also had a very different path and that was really encouraging for me to be like, oh, okay, I can, I, it, it reframed my sort of decisions and choices that I made along the way into a strength that like, you don't, you don't have to know exactly where you were going the whole time. Your story is still important and nobody has lived this life the way that I have lived this life. So um, I'm still, you know, working on my voice and figuring that out. I think that that will be a forever long process, but 
it is still, I think, necessary and important to recognize the, the things that make you unique and to celebrate that rather than the things that you wish were the same as everyone else. No, it's, it's great that they're different. It means that there is even more value to the stories that you bring. And is there, um, you know, speaking of that, so we're taking this like background, this deep emotional feeling, these, these passions that you have, is there an educational route or resource that you'd recommend for aspiring screeners to build their skill and craft to help support that kind of vision and background? So I, I recommend honestly, one main thing, like read, everybody always tells you to read, absolutely read, um, watch everything. Um, but like also watch mostly what you like because that informs what your instincts and vision and passions are. Uh, my biggest thing is I've always been big on um, classes and going to learn, um, learn it as much as I can, ideally in person if you can, um, because not just because of the teacher, but because those people that you are, meet are essentially your graduating class. These are the people that you will move up with in story, whether it be comics, whether it be novels, whether it be anything, television, this, this is the graduate class that you move through. So it, you know, what you learn in class is important, but more to me, more important are the people that you meet. Um, I try anytime that I am uh, in a class to reach out to almost everybody and say, can we grab a coffee? Um, I do the same thing. Whenever I'm in London, I, I try to um, get writers together to chat. Um, it, and do those coffees and do those one-on-ones because one, you'll get to talk about the media that you're discussing or that you're watching. Um, and that's really important to, to think about it critically and to be able to think with other people. Um, but also it, it creates community and that is what writing is. Writing is community. And it's very easy to think that writing is lonely and writing is on, on your, their own and not a thing that we get to, to be in a group with, but it, the most successful people I've seen are the people that surround themselves and um, work with others. Totally agree. I mean, that, the collaboration process is so key. And I've seen yeah. lots of people, I'm sure like you, who've gotten lots more work because of their, their willingness and their ability to like work together with other people and be in that communal space Absolutely. versus really talented people who were not willing to work well yeah. with others, play well with others. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so pretty, yeah, pretty intense. So, and I remember, so one of the things also that I, I thought was interesting and I wanted to hear your, your take on it is, you know, when I went to study acting and, and directing, there is this real desire to like they're saying watch everything watch the great stuff watch the classics watch the fluff but watch it from a different perspective are there any do you watch tv and film differently and if so like what are some things you look out for or try to understand while you're watching because it's hard to be a civilian now you know all these things you have this ability and skill um how do you watch differently that maybe people can can think about the next time they see something um i so I generally tend to watch television with my partner. And part of that is that almost after everything that we watch, every episode of television, every movie, we end up sitting and talking about it. Um, and we come from very different perspectives. We come from very different um, cultures. And that, that has been really helpful and changing. And just taking the time and creating that time to connect and point out like oh okay well this is what I saw or this is what I like I've been watching Dairy Girls for the first time and mm. on episode two I was like there was something that I am missing and I couldn't figure out what and for me because I'm an external processor I knew that I needed to talk it out and I was talking with my partner and I was like I really think that I I am missing a, a crucial moment in friendship for the girls because I haven't seen it yet it just is a thing that happens it's a slower process because it's not an American show. And so I'm not used to that. Um, and things like that are really beneficial. I think just talking it out, um, not being afraid to say, I didn't like this, but being open to trying and understanding why. Like there are many things in television that I don't like, but I think are still good. And it is helpful for me to know, oh, I didn't like this because 
I prefer X when it's when this person prefers Y. Mm -hmm. And knowing that those both of those things are beneficial, it's just it helps me more to understand, well, this is my instinct as a storyteller. Um, I will also say one book that I think that nobody ends up mentioning that I think is incredible and important to read is a book called Originals by Adam Grant. And I think I tell literally every person. Literally on my desk right now. Yes. I I think we talked about it last time. We did. I think we did. It is, it is one of my favorite books and it, it doesn't get talked about a lot because almost everyone, anytime anybody's talking about writing, they're like, oh yes, these writing books and yeah, originals is yeah. Yeah. And like craft is great, important, but like learning about where these ideas come from and how to develop them and, and be original and be creative is also important. And that book just completely changed my life and how I looked at writing and why I do different forms of media because one of the things he talks about is viewing like I I understand television in a different way because I have also been working in podcasts so I hear something differently I look I have a different idea for a story because uh, in comics that stems from working in animation all of these things do feed themselves and creates an interesting new way of looking at stuff so Great. Um, well, one last question, and then we'll sort of lightning around through anything in the Q and A. Um, right. This is going to put you on the spot. So pick. It doesn't have to be the most valuable. What What was a valuable piece of advice a fellow screenwriter gave you? If you had to impart one thing to everybody here. Yeah, that's right. Nick <sighs> Hornby, eat your heart out. One thing. One thing. Um. Honestly, I think. The piece that's sticking out to me now is just keep going. Like mm. there've been, and I'm, I'm speaking definitely from an emotional space. So that that is why it, it has spoken to me more is that I, you know, writing is exhausting and it's heartbreaking and I have cried over it more times than I can count. And every time I have reached out to um, somebody who has pulled me up and said, it's okay, like, be sad, but keep going. Um, One of those people, Meredith Glenn, who I worked with on Supernatural is beyond like just one of the best people on the planet. And every time I reach out to her, she's always there. She's always there to like, encourage me and lift me up and, and find those people like, you are worth being told that you are enough and your story is important and matters. And if there's people in your life that don't say that, then like, you know, that's not the person to go to, but it's, it is worth it. And so, yeah, I think just keep going because you're the emotions that you're feeling right now are are momentary and temporary and you will feel them again and again and again. Um, But just keep going. You'll feel better tomorrow. Beautiful. Uh, all right, we're going to lightning around through some of this Q&A uh, right. real quick. Any plans to have Connor Kent and Tim Drake talk about their past relationship in Young Justice and what this means now that Tim is out uh, as a bisexual? Charlie, well, I can't wait Charlie, for you Charlie, to... Charlie, Charlie, hold on. I, I know you want a lightning round, but I can't lightning like that. Word, <laughs> word. In mind, Got please. It. Thank you. Okay. Fair enough. Any plans um, to have Connor Kent and Tim Drake talk about their past relationship in Young Justice and what this means now that Tim is out as a bisexual. Uh, I can't wait for you to buy the comic and read all about it. That was quite the tease. Well done. All right, next one. <laughs> uh, um, Bella, okay, so Belen's Ortega's art is gorgeous. How did you do your scripts with her? More detailed, Alan Moore work or giving free reign? Um, that's a great question. I work mostly from, um, I do the Marvel style thing, which is I, I work on a plot basis. So I will send like page one, panel one. This is what I'm thinking. General idea on art. I like to give my artists a lot of space. Um, not only because that is the correct, like the nice etiquette thing to do, but also because they're very talented and, uh, I am not an artist. So um, Belen 
is and was and forever is amazing. And she did a phenomenal job with the very light touch that I gave her. Um, and that is, yeah, it, finding a finding an artist like that, I was out of this world blessed. Um, also, just want to note, uh, the book referred to by Megan Originals is in our audiobook playlist, uh, which I'm going to post here. Um, there are some amazing books in this playlist that we put together with Libro.fm, um, including some amazing books on creativity, The Artist's Way, Originals, um, and then some other things like, you know, some really beautiful mind opening, like Emergent Strategy by uh, Adrian Murray Brown and and um, uh, it's just amazing, amazing artists, uh, and thinkers and inspiring personalities on that list. So go check it out. Um, next, uh, let's see. I think there are a lot of questions here about how to get started on pitching. Um, it sounds like, and correct me if I'm wrong, one of the best ways to get started in pitching is just being in classes and being around other writers to help understand the network of how the avenues work to get a pitch in the door. Is there anything else you'd recommend in terms of pitching? A cold pitching how does it all work um unfortunately i think that it is it, it is difficult to pitch unless you are are going to meet someone so um a lot of places just don't do cold calls they don't do cold pitches um but what a lot of people do is um i would said i would just suggest reaching out to folks on twitter um and saying, hey, could you, if you have some time, could you read my script? Or I'd love to grab coffee. Uh, Zoom coffee is great. Everyone knows what Zoom is now. This is like the perfect time. Um, so I would I would reach out to people. Um, writing is, is amazing and important and only 10% of the job. Uh, agreed. And, and people, you know, another question came in, do we have to move to California? Do we have to move or is it now that it's more virtual? It sounds like you need to have the the right like network and sort of avenues and pathways of people, but uh, do you necessarily have to live in those areas to, to pursue? I, I'm i always the worst person with this question because I love California and I'm always like, why wouldn't anyone want to live here? This is the best. Um, however, um, I do think that um, especially starting out, it is helpful. Um, that being said, reach out to people, reach out to people in LA. It is about connections and meeting people. And I, everyone hates that advice. It doesn't sound fun or cute or sexy. That's fine. It, it, if you are, you never know what meetings are important. And it could be even like, if you're working at a target here and mm. you, you talk to somebody like it, every, every person here is trying to do the same thing. Um, that is why in general, people tend to say move to LA because every person here is trying to do something here. Um, that being said, like I said, like reaching out to people and saying, will you grab coffee with me? More often than not, people are going to be like everyone. Most people are like, ah, oh, people in LA are mean. They're not. Uh, if you ask more often than not, people will say yes. Yeah. Um, well, to wrap things up. So most of the projects you're working on right now are under NDA, but you do have uh, Young Justice Comics. So can you tell us about any other projects that you'd like to talk about right now that are out that people can go peruse? Yeah, um, that are out now. I have a Justice Society um, movie that I co-wrote with Jeremy Adams, who also worked on Supernatural. Um, someone asked also, by the way, what Funko Pops these are up here, uh, mm -hmm. Sam, mm -hmm. Dean and Cass, and also Scooby-Doo and The Haunted House. Um, this is my Scooby natural, uh, so shout out to Jeremy. Um, but so yeah, Ju Justice Society is on HBO Max. Um, I have a bunch of comics. Uh, I, Jeremy also was the, the story editor on a show called Monkey Kid, which is all on Amazon Prime. And I wrote an episode of that uh, in season two. I have uh, DC Superhero Girls. I have, um, like I said, a bunch of comics. If you go to DC, or or I just put a link tree up on my uh, Twitter. If you guys mm. want to go there, I have a DC uh, section that says all the comics that I've written for them. Um, and 
yeah, some other things that unfortunately are not announced yet. And yep. one day. Well, it's a good reason to follow you. So please go follow Megan uh, across her channels. Um, she's basically everywhere. She's got a link tree now. You can click on all the links. Um, but yeah, also, go follow real Megan. Quick, Real quick, if you're a comic book fan, um, the final uh, pre-order for my Tim Drake Pride special, which has all of the Tim Drake stories and a new one that is coming out June 14th. Um, the final pre-order for that is uh, tomorrow. Or no, yeah, it's tomorrow. So please reach out to your local comic book store. Pre-orders are super helpful. And then the final pre-order for Young Justice is a week from tomorrow. So uh, please pre-order. It is super, super helpful. Super important. Yeah, if you want to see the kinds of stories that Megan's a part of or other stories that you feel like are important to, to buy and show your support, monetarily through purchase and through watch time and through all those things, whether it's a streaming platform where they see all of your data, not that I'm revealing any secrets, they see everything you do. Or if you're purchasing from a publisher of any kind, that, that commerce shows engagement. Social media engagement's good and fine, but actual purchase and, and uh, talking about it after you've read it or watched it is, is really important to, to artists and to creatives. So thank you, Megan. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you guys so much for having me. This was amazing. You guys are amazing. And uh, I'm so happy to be here. So glad we were able to do it. Go follow Megan. Ask her lots of things. Retweet all of her things. Go click her link tree that she just made. It's a beautiful